What's going on, fellas? This is Mike D, Mr. Double Down on You with another episode of Black Fathers Now. Now dig this, we're gonna have a really powerful conversation today with a brother who has a story, who's had some twists and turns, he's got a journey, he's overcome some things, but he, he's just a dynamic brother. And the brother that I'm talking about is none other than my frat brother, Kenneth <laughs> Herring. Now Kenneth is originally from Oak Ridge, Tennessee, He's a graduate of UT Chattanooga. He, um, you know, he's a father. But when I met him, I've always recognized him as this connector. You know, this brother was always behind the scenes, organizing networking events. And if you went to a networking event or some who's who thing, you probably gonna see Kenneth up in the mix somewhere. And I've always recognized his brother that with that, you know, that gift or that skill. But I also noticed back in the day, and this is before everybody wearing pink all the time was like super, super popular. It's this brother that used to wear these pink glasses. And he would, used to always kind of like, well, what was this a story behind that? So we'll jump into the pink glasses. We'll jump into the connector story. But we'll also jump into how this brother is now working behind the scenes in the art community as the managing director of the River and Rail Theater Company. But y'all are going to hear all of that when we get into his story. So fellas, ladies listening to, let's welcome my man, my frat brother, Kenneth Herring. What's up, brother? Hey, Mike, it's good to be here. Thank you so much for that awesome introduction. I need the I need the recording of that. So if I ever make it in life, that's the recording. That's the introduction I'm going to use. <laughs> that's the one I'm going to use. <laughs> Look, I can I dig that, it. man. Look, I will give you authorization to utilize that. <laughs> Y'all can hear this publicly now, right? <laughs> nah, that's good, man. Dude, man, you know, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. We have to give people their roses when they can smell them. And so sometimes when we are doing dynamic things, when we're impacting the world, in our own way, we don't take enough time to take a step back and really recognize what it is we're doing. So to me, the introductions are extremely important for not necessarily the people, but for a lot of times the brother that I'm having a conversation with to really recognize the impact that they're having on the world. So I salute you even before we get into your story. So brother, the introduction was very much well-deserved. I appreciate it, man. I'm happy to be here and happy to be a part of the show. And hopefully I can say something that um, will help someone. That's the biggest thing for me. Oh. Look, look, check this out. You wouldn't be here if you didn't have something that could help somebody. So <laughs> <laughs> let's let's know let's know that from the jump. You dig? There we go. Okay, we got off to a good start. Jump, that that's it, man. That's it. But before we jump into your story, man, everybody who listens to the show knows we always start with shout outs because who are we without those individuals or entities that are the wind beneath our wings? And you also give credit to the most important folks up front. So, man, give some shout outs before we jump into your journey. Yeah, that's really cool that you do that. I've, I've been uh, on several podcasts before and I've never had anyone that started the show like that. So man, I think that's awesome. So so for me, the, the outside of my son, and we'll get into him obviously a little bit later on. Uh, but for me, the two people that I always like to talk about are my mother and my brother. Um, they were so um, instrumental in me growing up. My mother um, left to to go home to be with the Lord in 2005. We'll talk about that a little bit as we get into the pink glasses. And my brother lives here in Knoxville, um, retired um, Army veteran. Uh, and so I always like to make sure that I tell people that they're responsible for who I am and why I am. So um, definitely want to make sure that I give both of them the respect that they earn. Mm, I love that, man. Your mother and your brother, give them the respect that they earn. And it literally goes back to this whole notion of we need to do a better job of giving people their roses now, right? Letting people know what they mean to you now. Because again, right now is all we have. The past is gone. What's coming is unknown, right? And so while we have the opportunity to celebrate individuals, to share how much they mean to you, we need to do that on a very continual basis. And a lot of times we don't realize how much that means to people to recognize that they're making an impact. So continue yeah. to, to continue to celebrate and lift folks up, man, as you go along, brother. Absolutely. 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 And so thinking of, you know, you mentioned your mother and you mentioned your brother, take us back, man. Like you said, you graduated from Oak Ridge High School, which is, you know, around the Knoxville, Tennessee area. Take us back to your origin story, man, because again, I've always known you as a connector. I've always known you as this brother who just brings people together, brings entities together. But you've also been in the arts and you you got this wide kind of this eclectic background. Talk to us a little bit about your journey growing up, brother. 
Yeah. So it's funny. I, I was, <laughs> um, I have one claim to fame. You talked about being from Oak Ridge, a small town right outside of Knoxville, Tennessee. My only claim to fame um, is that I'm the only person, in the, or the first person, excuse me, in the history of Oak Ridge boys basketball to both play and coach in a state tournament. So I always tell people that that was a really cool deal. Since then, we we had a gentleman who coached the state tournament last year who played in it also. Shouts out to Ted Mitchell. He's like 23, 24, 25 years old. I'm 40. So I held uh, that distinction for a long time before he came along. So I was always really proud of that. Um, huge basketball fan growing up. Um, decent basketball player in high school. Um, and But I tell people all the time that the first things that I ever – got my mother to spend money on, but was, was not sports related. It wasn't basketball, it wasn't football or baseball or soccer or anything like that. The first things that I ever convinced my mother to spend money on were tap dance lessons and acting lessons. Those are the Hold two on. things that I, that I convinced my mother at six, seven, eight years old that I wanted to do. Um, I saw, I remember being a little boy and seeing Gregory Hines and Sammy Davis Jr. Mm. Um, and, and being really inspired, Gregory Hines specifically, and really just wanting to be him. And that was the first person I ever wanted to be. Um, and I, you know, love Magic Johnson, Allen Iverson, you know, all the basketball players, right, growing up. But, um, but I wanted to be in the arts from a little boy. And so I was actually a really talented actor, um, won a very prestigious award, uh, the Renatna Fusco Award. Um, for the Odyssey of the Minds program. It's an after-school acting program um, that was there in the Maryland and uh, D.C. metro area when I was growing up as a little boy. Um, had about four or 500 kids, and they awarded five kids the highest honor for mm -hmm. acting. Okay. Uh, and I was about seven or eight years old, and they awarded me this award. I had no idea it was a thing, and I just remember one of the parents of one of the girls who was in my acting ensemble, she came in, and she was so excited, and she said, Ken, if you won the award, you won the award. And I'm just a little boy. I didn't have any idea what the lady was talking about. Um, but it was a big deal. It was five out of uh, 500 kids. So, uh, but I got away from it and got into sports growing up. Um, and so um, that's a story in and of itself. One that I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I left, but I'm also glad that I came back because um, I'll, I'm very happy with my time with the game of basketball. Dude, I want you. I want you to pause for a second because you yeah. you, you mentioned at six or seven, at six or seven, yeah. you were inspired by Gregory Hines and Sammy mm -hmm. Davis Jr. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. at six or seven, I may have recognized Gregory Hines or Sammy Davis Jr., but I would at six or seven did not connect with and was not inspired by Gregory Hines and Sammy Davis Jr. And again, you and I are in the same age bucket. You know, I'm almost 42 and, you know, you're 40. So uh -huh. we're from a different era than when Gregory Hines and Sammy Davis Jr. They're like our parents' age or yeah, actually yeah. grandparents' age, if you really yeah. look at it. Yeah. How did, I mean, what was it about Sammy Davis Jr., but more importantly, Gregory Hines, that inspired you as a six, six or seven-year-old? Like, to me, that's still fascinating because that to me is kind of like an anomaly mm -hmm. in today's age. Yeah. You know, I, I think it was, I don't know if it was more dancing or if it was just more of performing and entertaining. Mm. And I can't think of, um, oh my gosh, um, there was a show and I, it, it might have been um, moving on up, moving on up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're talking about uh, what you call them, the Jeffersons? Yes, the Jeffersons. And I feel like there was a scene in the Jeffersons at the beginning of it where George, when he was coming in, used to dance. He used to do like a little jig. Uh -huh. And I used to, my mother, I remember her having her friends over at the house and she would always say, Kenneth, go ahead and do it. And when it would come on, I mean, I would go into full mode and I would do that little dance. And I think it was the combination of me dancing wow. versus me loving to perform with me saying, oh, I can get somebody's attention and I can mm. entertain them and I can make them happy if I do this thing. And so I think subconsciously that kicked in for me and I always liked it. And so dancing was just the first way that I found that I could entertain people. Um, but acting was- pause, I, want you to pause, I want you to pause there for a second. That's, that's, that's interesting. So as a young kid, you basically got this internal high from yes. entertaining people, yes. right? Mm -hmm. And yes. now a question, because sometimes people that's rooted in something else like is that was that something in which you always were the one trying to 
you know, make people happy? Were you the one that was always trying to entertain, trying to lift people's spirits? Like, did you ever feel like you were that one as a little kid? I, I think so. And the reason I think so is because we had homecoming down in Chattanooga last weekend. And my ace, number one on my line, we were talking to a gentleman that um, worked in the uh, basketball arena when we were in school. And he's still there. And he had the full UTC garb on. I mean, a nice sweatsuit. And, and I was uh, joking with him that they needed to put his name in the rafters at some point in time because of all the people that he had worked with and mm -hmm. all the people that he helped out. You know, the old head that when you're yeah. a young kid in college, you know, gives you good advice, maybe throws you a few dollars. He was always that guy. Mm -hmm. And um, as my ace and I were walking away, he said to me, one thing I've always learned from you, Kenneth, is to do your best to make people feel good. Mm. And so I think that has come with, I don't know where it, come, where it came from as a little boy. I don't know what happened before the Jefferson mm -hmm. dancing yeah. to maybe want to be that person. But I can definitely say that over the last, you know, 35 years of my life that I can remember, it's always made me feel good to make other people feel good. Ooh, that's fascinating. Look, this, and again, I, I want brothers to pay attention to that. It's like, it's interesting how there are things inside of us that need to get pulled out. And to be honest, a lot of times we have to have people who are in tune, who are intentional, and who are aware of those things that are inside of us to help usher those things out. Because a lot of times there's so many kids, and I, especially in the Black community, so many of our young kids are sitting on so much genius, but there are not always these individuals around them to pull that stuff out for them to see that. So that's, and I'm going to jump way ahead kind of to the end of the conversation of what we wanted to talk about, but I see now we're going to go back and forth, which I yes. love. Okay. love um, but I'm starting to see, having been in the arts as, as a full-time employee for only four months, I'm starting to see the disparity in the opportunities that young Black kids have. Um, and it's, it's, it's interesting because if you think about this. People say that your artistic side of your brain is 50% of your brain. Like we all have that 50% of our brain. However, the vast majority of people do not are, or are not employed in the arts full time. Mm -hmm. What you're doing right now, this interview, this is your artistic release. Yep, this absolutely. is you being an artist. This is how you express yourself. This, mm -hmm. is how you, this is how you tell the world how you see it. This is how you interact with the world and engage with other people as they interact with the world. And that's art. Mm -hmm. That is art. What we don't have oftentimes in the black community are parents or individuals who can help guide us down that path because they themselves yeah. were guided down that path. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest challenges with the arts community is the lack of funding. In. When you think of the word artist, mm -hmm. when you think of why parents don't want their child to be an artist, it's because they don't want their child to be a blank artist. Starving artist, that's right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. they don't, nobody wants their child to be a starving or struggling artist. Like, no, go to college, get a degree, major in business, go to job, go, get a, go to corporate America and work your way up the ladder. Mm -hmm. And that's what we tell people. And so as you look at even middle-class white kids that are learning that, imagine what lower-class black kids are learning and imagine what opportunities they're missing out on because they don't have that funding in their school because <sighs> nobody's there to have an after school program for them. So <laughs> it, it, go ahead. No, no, I was gonna, I was gonna say it's so powerful that you're saying that. And I think, cause you know, I'm, my, my gifting is, is as a communicator, right? I'm a communicator, but yeah. then also my other gifting is in my curiosity, right? So I'm a curious communicator. Like I'm one that's curious about everything but I'm more so curious about people and their stories and the why behind it. How did you get here? What influenced this? Like, those are the things that influence me. And that's what really drives me. But when you were talking and you were talking about arts and the starving artist and uh -huh. art programs and art funding, as a communicator, it makes me think about the narrative or the definition, right? So when you say art, or artist, you automatically think painter or yes, sculptor yes, or yes, some exactly. kind of designer or whatever. But when you take a step back and you used it in the sense of like this podcast is my artistic expression, mm -hmm. really the arts is not necessarily about creating art. It's more so about creativity, right? And so, I'm, I'm gonna pause you right there. You said not about creating art. We have to 
define there what you go. art is. There you okay? go. So let's let's define what art. Okay, now let's stop there and say that. But I want to keep you keep going on what you just said. Yeah, yeah because because the thing is, I think when we think about the whole and it goes back, to, and I think we are we're basically playing conversational jazz right now. We're going back and yeah. forth and improvisation and all of that, which is really dope. Because it's you're art saying as well. Say what now? Improv, which is That's art. It. That's <laughs> art. That's art. That's yeah. art. Yeah. But I think, but to your point, though, I think it all comes back to the concept of definition, because when you think about creative solutions, that's an artistic expression. When you think about a consultant that gets yeah. hired and paid millions and millions and millions of dollars, a management right. consultant to come in and give creative solutions or to help an organization rebrand their thought process or rebrand their mission. Or you look at recently Facebook just changed their whole branding to meta to, you know, to talk about the metaverse and all of that. That, those are all artistic expressions, but it's more creative solutions. And so if we can rebrand the concept of art, not just being playing an instrument, drawing or painting to creative solutions, then when you start talking about the economics of it all, then you can start to have a tangible connectivity or tangible connection to art and the resources because i think a lot of it is just the concept of branding because people who don't think with their artistic mind can't see the creative solution part they just look at the starving artist they don't realize that this air quotes starving artist can help double triple quadruple revenue or uh, increase the bottom line by bringing this creative solution to the table and so it's just, it's interesting because oh yeah i think we're going down a rabbit hole which i really like yeah no i i never so you look at 50% of our brains being artistic or what you just talked about, creative solutions. I, I've never, you just gave me gave me a new perspective as we talk to businesses about mm -hmm. how, they can support, how they can support our nonprofit theater company. I think that's one of the things that we can really talk to them about how to help future generations is how do you creative, how do you creatively solve business challenges? Solve how problems. Dude, that's it. It's all about see, you gotta see communication is not about having the best diction. It's not about the person with the long, the biggest vocabulary. No, it's about impact, right? And so yeah. the first thing you need to do to effectively communicate is you need to understand the audience that you're speaking to. So if you all are in uh, an accounting firm speaking to them, trying to get money, don't go in there talking about some artwork on the wall and all of that. You need to come in and say, like, dude, you all need some creative solutions to mm -hmm. do this and you start speaking to the bottom line, you start speaking their language, they understand that. On the flip side, if they come in talking about various algorithms and something about regression analysis on this and that to the artistic community, they're gonna be like, okay, you're glossing over me. But you have yeah. to speak the language to That's the cute. audience you're speaking to because dude, creative solutions are needed everywhere. everywhere. In the most mundane businesses, they I mean, are looking for creative solutions. Every day, whether you're a parent, you know, you got to have creative solutions as yes. a parent, as a friend, and your, and your relationship with your significant other. Mm -hmm. The creative solutions and our, and our ability to keep things fresh and to look at things differently and create um, new approaches, that's, that's, called, that's called being a human being. Yes. That's what that's called. Oh, dude, you, you, it's interesting. Art is called being a human being. Like, I, I think mm. there's some type of connection wow. to it. Yeah. But again, like it's a, mm -hmm. what'd you say? I like that because yeah. we're all artists. Everyone is an artist. And this is why I've got a three-year-old son. You can get into him at any point in time that we want to. And you want to know what he loves to do? He loves to play make-believe. Mm. Do you want to know what make-believe is? Mm. Acting. Mm. That's what he loves to do. He loves to act. I mean, he loves to he loves to yes. build things. He loves to draw. He loves to paint. Uh, he loves to dance. He loves music. He loves all things that are artistic. And so for me, when you talk about, you know, one of the, one of the biggest, one of the things that makes me the most happy about being in the arts is the ability that I have now to encourage my son to chase whatever artistic passion he displays. I'm a firm believer that between the ages of six and eight, every human being shows a propensity and a desire to be or do a certain thing. Mm -hmm. Every human, every child. 100%. Whatever, whatever kid, every kid out there in America, they show, they tell their parents that between six and eight, it's just up, up to us as parents to foster it. Dude, you, you, you hit the, 
it's interesting. So I'm putting together, basically it's a parenting guide and it's based off of four concepts. And it literally leans into what exactly you're talking about. And the four concepts are expose, identify, nurture, and accelerate. So as parents, as dads, we're here to expose our kids to various ideas. You know, exposure leads to expansion or exposure leads to opportunity. Then it's all about identifying where do they have proclivities? Where do they have interests? Where do they have natural talents or gifts? When you notice something, it's like, make a note of this. Like, there's something here, right? But then it's about nurturing that. So you have to nurture that talent, that gift, that skill, that interest that your kid is showing. But then once you start to nurture it and they have interest in it, it's time to pour gasoline on the fire and accelerate. Yeah, and so as key as parents, as dads, that's something that we need to be focused on if we're wanting our kids to be the highest manifestation of what they're capable of being. Yeah, and that and that's the key. It's pouring into it. You're right, man. You're right. So it's hmm. just, you know, I said I had a uh, a video of my son uh, playing a keyboard. Well, he was acting like he was playing yeah, yeah. a keyboard, and he was just so enthused, and, and people just loved it. And it was of all of the videos that I have posted of my son on my Instagram and Facebook stories, of all the ones I posted over the last three years of him playing, of us together, him doing something cute, he and I interacting in a very um, loving manner. There were no more the one of him being artistic got the most engagement. Mm. That's the one that people interacted with the most was the one of him being expressive, him, you know, acting like he was playing the keyboard and making a hand gesture and, you know, being a conductor in that moment. Like that's what people, that's what resonated with people. People felt they saw the emotion from an mm. artist and they connected with that. Mm. Dude, I, I'm gonna tell you, it's like I wrote down this note when you were talking a second ago, and I said, art equals creative solutions. Like, and it's just like what you're just saying there. I mean, the most engagement came from this artistic expression. Art equals creative solutions. Um, even if creative solutions to boredom, creative solutions to business, creative the solutions to your relationships, it's all about art. And but again, how do you define art? And I think you posed that question earlier. Yeah, I think, I mean, art's anything you create. Anything I mean, you create. Anything. You, I mean, people, I mean, if you're, if you're in construction, you know what I mean? Like, you're an artist. You're an artist. You know? If you have the ability to properly put together someone's tax portfolio, like, mm -hmm. you're an artist. You know what I mean? Like, there are a you're lot creating. of different things. Anything that is creative has an artistic component to it. You're building it. You're creating it. Think about this, too. If we are created, what does that make us? If we're creative, then we are all pieces of art. Come on. Come we're on. All art. Everybody. So, everybody. So, so when someone says they're removing funding for art programs, they're removing funding from us because yeah. we are art. They're yes, they're taking away from us as human beings. Yeah. And so, you know, you talked about, you know, the connector piece. And one of, you know, one of the big things that I want to be able to do is to connect um, disadvantaged or disenfranchised communities with the arts and provide opportunities for black and brown children and just poor children in general. You know, mm -hmm. um, you know I, I think, you know, we look at poverty and we, we only place it on black and brown children, but there are a lot of white children that are living in poverty as well. Um, mm -hmm. And I think if we can put those white children in a, in a room with black and brown children and have mm -hmm. all of them get together and be artistic together, then all the other things that we worry about as human beings will take care of themselves. Whew. We can we can make a take a huge step forward. If we can just get those poor black, poor brown, poor white kids in the same room at the same time and have them discover art together. We can change the world by doing that. Because just like I just said in my the notes that I made from uh, from some of your the bars that you were dropping, art equals creative solutions. Mm -hmm. yeah. Dude, that's, mm, that's so yeah. So my, so my journey was, um, I, I have a, a business background, a degree in communications, and an MBA uh, from Bethel University out in Western Tennessee. Uh, and so the last 10 years before I got into the arts full time was spent as a, uh, as a sales rep uh, in the information technology services um, sector. So um, sold hardware, sold software solutions, software as a service products. Um, um, enterprise level solutions, small business solutions, just the whole gambit of IT products and services. Uh, and 
I, I tell you the, the the day that or the the month that changed my life. I don't remember the date, um, but I woke up one day in, in January 2017, and I told myself that I was going to chase all the dreams that I had as a little boy, mm. everything that I ever wanted to do, um, that I was going to do it. I didn't care the scale, the scale and the size, how big I got didn't matter. Doing it was the only thing that mattered. Mm. And so everything that I wanted to do was all centered in the entertainment sector. So it was, what can I do around acting? Big screen, small screen. What can I do around, um, I always wanted to host my own radio show. Mm. Um, so I, um, but you know, ended up hosting my own podcast. Um, got into modeling, um, did the whole runway thing. Um, did various content creation productions, started to write, started to blog, started to blog, um, wrote a book. I mean, just did all of the things artistically that I ever wanted to do. And I was just doing them. They were all on the small scale. Um, but I was happy because I was creating and mm. I was being artistic and I was doing the things that I enjoyed to do. Um, all while I was working in my full-time job with the dream and the goal that one day, one of my hashtag I hate Mondays mm. vlogs or vlogs would blow up and somebody mm. would see me and they would be like, oh my gosh, this guy's entertaining and, and we want to give him all this money in order to be, you know, the social media um, influencer. Mm -hmm. um, but the moment that changed my life was I had a friend who I met through networking and connecting who I met and she said, hey, I see that you are doing acting um, on TV right now. Mm -hmm. I'm on the board of directors for a theater company. They're having auditions for an ensemble. And I wanna know if you're interested. And I was scared when I read the message. I didn't know how to take that mm -hmm. because I was used to acting in, in, a, in a B market for a B market production company. You know, good, mm -hmm. good B market. Knoxville has some good B market production companies here locally. Not a lot of people know that. But I mean, if you mess up, they just tell you, you know, okay, we'll do it again, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what I was used to. But stage acting, mm -hmm. well, that's another story right there. Mm -hmm. So I had a moment and this is the moment that changed my life. I looked at Denzel Washington, who I believe is the greatest actor ever. Mm -hmm. Actually, I, I think he's as good or better in his profession than anybody that's ever had any craft. He's mm -hmm. that good. And I told myself, Denzel was a great stage actor. And if you want to be a great actor, then you have to get on the stage like Denzel did. Mm. And that was my motivation. And I got outside of my own fears. And in my quest to be like Denzel Washington, I, um, I said, yeah, I'm going to do it. And I went for the auditions. And I, I was cast as a member of the ensemble and um, started fulfilling my acting career. Uh, and that one decision, that one decision, to get on the stage is what changed my life more than anything. That mm. one decision, overcoming my fear, chasing the one dream I had as a kid mm. to be an actor and saying, I'm gonna do it, mm. changed my life forever. Man, and so you said in 2017, you just basically, you came to this conclusion that I'm gonna chase everything that I wanted to do as a kid. And this was before you became a dad. Yes. When you started this journey. But this was also after you started wearing the pink glasses that I when I met you back in the day. Correct. Yeah. And yeah. so the pink glasses has a, is a totally different story. And did that have anything to do with the inspiration behind you chasing your dreams? So, um, yeah, because it all had to do with my mother. So my mother passed away of breast cancer on December 17th of 2005. I was 24, about to turn 25. So it was just a few days before Christmas. So we're coming up on 16 years here um, next month. Can't believe it's been that long. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I remember being a little boy and my mother always whispered in my ear, you can do whatever you want. So mm -hmm. I try to do that to my son as often as all the times. So you can do whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. And she instilled a level of confidence in me that I could be successful. Now, one of the best things, my mother was the key in my ability to be a good public speaker. 
which being a good public speaker has helped me tremendously to be a great connector mm -hmm. because I can get in front of a room and people say, okay, that's the guy I need to meet. And then I can step down and say, you meet this person. I can do mm -hmm. that for our room. And then I can go home and take a nap. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but my mother raised me in the church and my mother had a huge fear of public speaking. She wow. was terrified to death like many Americans. And there's actually been studies that have, that studies have been done that said people are more afraid of public yep. speaking than they are of dying. Yep. That's crazy. Yep. So my mother, I remember two things that she did. Number one, I remember being a little boy, six, seven, eight years old. My brother and I sitting in the hallway of the local community college while my mother took Toastmasters class. Mm. While she went in and faced her fears head on. Didn't mm. run. She went and said, this is what I want to do. And she mm. went and did it. What she did for me so that because she saw a, pro a proclivity in me for public speaking, that I was a good orator, was she always volunteered me for speaking, the speaking portion of whatever was going on for Sunday school. So whether it was a scripture, whether it was the prayer, welcoming guests and visitors, mm. taking up the offering, she was always like, Kenneth will do it. Kenneth will do it. Wow. Kenneth will do it. And I remember one time I looked at her and I said, Ma, she had volunteered me for all four things. And they were like, okay, Kenneth, you'll do it. And I said, Ma, can I just do all of this at one time? Like, can I just go up there once and do the, mm -hmm. do the whole thing instead of having to get up and down? Um, obviously they, they didn't let me, mm -hmm. but my mother made me get in front of people all the time and speak in front of them at a young age. And she did that based off her fears. Do, do, okay, well, see, we got that's a, that's such a gem. And brothers listening again, this is Black Fathers Now. I want you to pay attention to what his mother did. She did not allow her fears to be placed on her child. Like that. That's see what we tend to do at times if we're not careful is we place our fears on our children, and we then pass that thing on. And something that our kids maybe have a proclivity for or maybe want to go into, they have no choice because their parents are placing their fears on them. And, and it's interesting because- And let me say would, something very quickly. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, brother. The challenge is black people as a whole in America have more fears than white people, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you have more fears and you place more fears, keep going. That's, that, dude, I'm, I'm gonna tell you, it, it's, it's so powerful to think about that. And I hope brothers are taking heed to this and I hope you're thinking, if you're a dad listening to this, or ladies, if you're a mom listening to this, make sure that you're not passing your fears down to your children, because you can, in essence, be putting an anchor around their ankle or around their neck, which is holding them back. And, and it makes me think about my personal experience. There were two things that stand out. So my mother growing up couldn't swim. She was scared of the water, right? Right. But the, the flip side of that is, you know, my father grew up and he was a lifeguard growing up. And part of that inspiration was my father had a brother that drowned when he was a kid. Right. And so because of that, all of them learned to swim and, and all of that. But my mom never wanted her fear of water to pass down to us. So we started taking swimming lessons from the time we were like six months old on up until we were almost taking a lifeguard courses ourselves. She didn't allow that to happen. And one more time was, you know, I grew up wanting to play football, 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 football. I was all football every all day, every day. But my mom was, you know, being a nurse was scared about me getting hurt. So she did not want me to play football. And it took her having interactions with various guys who were adults at the time, who, in essence, told her about how much they resented their parents for not allowing them to play football because they wanted to play. And that resonated with her. So she didn't allow her fear of us getting hurt or whatever to keep us from actually getting out and actually playing football. And so to your point, it's just to me, all these examples are so poignant in the sense that we cannot allow our personal fears to pass down to our children. Yeah. And that, that's so true. And, and that's, you know, I, I tell people, I, I want to go on that. I want to say that. Um, and I want to say something that I was talking to one of our fraternity brothers about this morning um, that, is so important, is equally as important um, as not passing our fears down to our children. And that is this, and it goes in the same vein. It's taking the good advice of other people. I cannot stress enough to any individual how important it is to take good advice from somebody else 
and execute on it. Mm -hmm. In our lives, people are looking at us in a different way than we're looking at ourselves. Mm -hmm. They see things about us that we don't see. They see mm -hmm. our strengths and they see our weaknesses in ways that it's very, very difficult for us to view because we're looking at it subjectively. They're looking at it objectively. So when someone says you should do this, you should try that, you should think about these things. Maybe you should consider this thing. Do it. Do it. Mm -hmm. They're outside of me, Kenneth Heron, saying, I'm going to get on the stage like Denzel. Everything else I did in my journey to get me in my dream job was the idea of someone else. Mm. Everything. I, there was, there's not one thing that I did other than me getting on the stage, having the strength and the courage to do that. There's not one thing that wasn't someone else's idea, and I got a call about that. Man, hold on. I'm going to throw something at you. And I, and I think, and again, see, sometimes these things take deeper, more spiritual turns, and it's interesting. So, and I've referenced this on probably 100 episodes, if not more. Uh, one of my favorite books is called The Alchemist, right? And so The Alchemist by Paolo Coelho, and if you think about the book, The Alchemist, the whole theme of it is as you pursue your personal legend, the universe conspires to help you along on your journey. And so it's interesting, you, once you make a commitment, once you set the intention, and once you start walking down a particular path, and as long as that path is aligned with what God has in store for you, things start to open up. Thing, you, you start to get calls from individuals that I couldn't have planned that this person picked the phone up and said, hey, would you please come and apply for this opportunity? Or, hey, would you come and call this person? Or, hey, this thing is over here. But it's interesting because it's all aligned with the direction that you're walking in. And this is of no, basically there's nothing that you did. The only thing that you did was you made the commitment to start walking in that direction. And I would even take it back to when you mentioned in 2017 in January, when you made the commitment to go after all the dreams that you had as a kid, the moment that you made that commitment, that you set that intention and you started walking in that path is the moment that opportunities start to open up. That's when you get a call. Hey, have you ever thought about this? Hey, have you ever thought about this? Hey, there's an opportunity over here. Hey, I have somebody I want you to talk to. All of these things, like you just mentioned, came from the outside, but I would challenge that it really didn't come from the outside. It really came from the inside after you chose to make that initial decision. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, absolutely. I mean, the once I told myself and I started my journey almost five years ago to chase my dreams, Every, everything has fallen into place. I, I couldn't imagine, I could not have written a better position for me to be in right now. Mm -hmm. If somebody said, Kenneth, write down your dream job. And that's what's crazy. I'm in a dream job that I didn't know existed until April of this year. I didn't even know this existed until six or seven months ago. I've been doing theater, acting in theater for four years. And I never thought about working for a theater company. That wasn't something that was on my radar. But every single thing I've done in my entire life, all of those things have brought me to this one place and they're all my, all of the skills are in my tool belt right now. There's so many different things that I can use because I'm in my space. And I know every day when I wake up, I know that there is no one that can do my job better than me. There's Ooh. no one. I am, I am the best at my job. No one can do this job at River and Rail the same way that I can. And that's a very powerful feeling. And it all started, like you said, from that day when I was laying in bed, and this is the key for me anyway, when I was laying in bed by myself, mm -hmm. I didn't do it for my mother and breast cancer awareness, raising money. I didn't do it for my son. He wasn't even thought of. I chased my dreams solely for me. Mm. There was nobody else involved. Mm. Now I'm glad to honor my mother's memory and I'm happy to show my son a father that is chasing his dreams every day but I didn't do it for either one of those two individuals mm. I didn't do it for my brother I did it for me and you have to make that commitment for you because somebody else that you make commitment for could leave you mm -hmm. and then what do you have mm. 
you have to do these things for you. And so um, for me, just being in that moment by myself and making that commitment to myself and holding myself accountable to chasing my dreams, mm. once I made that commitment and started on that path and stayed focused, the world, like you said, created a, a position for me that is everything I could have ever wanted. Man, it, it, it stated famously biblically, your gifts will make room for you. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, we have to do our part, you yeah. know, and our part is we have to make that commitment to what's in, that thing that's inside of you, that thing that's inside of you, you have to make that commitment. And brothers, I hope that you're listening to what Kenneth just mentioned. It all started from him making that commitment and him listening to that thing that's inside of him. Because the thing is, we all have that thing. And, and, I, and I'll tell you, it's interesting. When I have conversations with brothers on, you know, on the back end coaching and talking about this and talking about that, there are a lot of brothers that have that thing that's really tugging at them, but they're scared to answer that call. And the thing is, once you say, you know what, I'm no longer scared, I'm going to answer that call, that's when everything opens up. Is it going to be easy? No. But that's when things start to open up and you start to understand what it really means to be in your zone of genius, to be in the zone, to walk in your purpose. Once you start walking down that path, I mean, this path that I'm on right now as a personal development coach, as a podcaster, as a creator, as an advisor on the back end, you know, consuming all of this content. And I've come to understand I consume so much stuff and 90 percent of it is not for me. I consume these things so that I can then pass it on to somebody else because they're the ones in need of this. This person is struggling with that. That person is, has issues with this. Oh, I consume this, which can help that and connect the dots because I have some background and context. Now this is a creative solution, AKA art, for yep. them to go and apply to their life, right? And so when we start to understand that, and you can listen to the story of Kenneth, he made a commitment for himself, but the thing is, he himself was influenced by all of these inputs. So his mom, his brother, his experiences, his MBA, his college, being with the bros, doing, I mean, traveling, doing art, playing basketball, coaching, all of these things come full circle to become tools in his tool belt, right? And so now you got a full tool belt. Now and somebody says, I need you to come build something. See, back in the day, you just had a hammer. Mm -hmm. Now you got a full, you got a full tool belt at your, at your disposal. Yeah. So now yeah. what's up? Yeah. And it, once you, once you have that, man, like you had, like you described and we're able to do different things and play with different tools. And mm -hmm. now we've got a hammer and a screwdriver and maybe a jigsaw, you mm -hmm. know, maybe power drill. Um, you just can do so much more. And so, so for me, um, that's been it. Um, mm -hmm. It's just getting in my lane and, and once you, and everybody has a space. Yes. The space that I, that I started on July 6th when I entered into this, um, into this life changing opportunity. Um, everybody has a space that, that they can be as confident and as, as competent as I am in what I do. Everybody has this. It's just a matter of making up your mind that you want to follow your dreams and, and going out and find it. Mm. So now let's, let's speak about that space. Uh, you mentioned River and Rail Theater Company, where you are the managing director. Talk mm -hmm. to us a little bit about what you're doing, some of the things that you've you know, been involved yeah. in and how all of your tools come to play to yeah. build something great. Yeah. So River and Rail Theater Company is um, a professional theater company in the old city, uh, which is in downtown Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, we're, in a, we're in a historic building. As you can see, a little bit behind me is not actually Knoxville's first ice factory. Mm. Uh, and so um, our building is named the Old City Performing Arts Center. Uh, and so um, all of our plays have a social or racial, racial justice component to it. So the play that we did in the fall was called Passover by Antoine, Antoinette Nwandu. Um, it dealt with uh, police brutality and systemic racism. Um, we do a, a family play um, in, um, in December for, for Christmas. It's called The Unusual Tale of Mary and Joseph's Baby. But our social justice twist on that is um, we tell the real story of Mary and Joseph um, being refugees, being immigrants, having to flee their land and, and go to another place, which is oftentimes lost over. Um, our play in February uh, is called In the Next Room or the vibrator play. So it's a play about the history of the vibrator. Oh, wow. uh, and so women's issues, women's health issues more specifically are the centerpiece of that play. And then uh, our play in the spring is called Sweat. The entire play takes place in a bar. It's a flashback between 2000 and 2008 um, in Reading, Pennsylvania, which at that time 
was the poorest country, poorest city in America. And it talked about how um, racial and ethnic uh, and social strife started happening once automation and outsourcing became more prevalent at the very beginning of the century. So um, we deal with some heavy topics. Yes. Um, we deal with some real issues. Um, and, uh, and so we, we want to make sure that we uh, engage the Knoxville community in, in what we think is what we think are important topics. Mm, man, that's, whew, dude. Yeah. And, 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 when, and you're the managing director. So what does your role entail within this, this whole scheme of things? Yeah, so my job is to manage really two business units. One is River and Rail Theater Company. So that's everything from working with um, at, um, our actors union um, to working with the actual actors that are in the union, making sure that uh, they have housing, making sure that all the contracts are negotiated, making sure the organization that we have payroll done, our bookkeeping is done, and accounting is done, finance are in, in order, and all the things that it takes to make a business run. Mm -hmm. My job is to make sure that all those operational things, the marketing, all of that stuff is in place. And then we own our building, which is the old city performing arts center. And we have, um, it's an event venue. So we have concerts and weddings and special events and receptions and anything that you can name from a special event standpoint, I manage our facility as well. So the booking, the contracts with that, um, any repairs, that our 130 year old facility may need. Um, mm -hmm. My responsibility is to make sure that all of those things are taken care of as well. So managing the river and rail side of the business the operations and then managing our facility and the business operations that go with that. So, you know what, you know, and it's, it's interesting. I think when we defined earlier what art is, you know, that would also define an artist. So one who brings creative solutions to the table is an artist. So to your core through and through my brother you're an artist thank you brother i appreciate that man mm -hmm. and, and so with all of these you know experiences and this journey and this commitment and walking on this particular path you're also a dad and mm -hmm. so talk to me about how these experiences everything comes full circle to impact you as a dad specifically a black father the biggest thing that i want my son well there are two things Maybe three. <laughs> Come on, um, you got it. I, I want my son to feel safe and secure with me. When he and I are together one-on-one, -on -one, I want him to know that his father loves him and that everything is okay and that he is going to be safe and that he is going to be healthy and that he is protected. That is the most important thing to me is that he feels safe and loved and protected. Um, in addition, I want him to see his father chasing his personal dreams every day. Every single day that I wake up, I chase everything I ever wanted to do. And I'm so fortunate to be able to do that. And not many people can truly say that. And I just want my son to see it. I don't want to tell him anything about it. Mm -hmm. I just want him to see it. I want him to see somebody that's happy here because mm. they're doing what they are in love with. And I'm in love with what I do. Mm. And then the third thing is, I just want him to understand the commitment and the sacrifice that it's going to take to be successful, because it's going to be different for, for him than for people that don't look like him. And so I, I'm just happy to be in a place emotionally, emotionally, where I can give my son the time and the space that he needs. And, and I, I made this Facebook post a couple weeks ago and uh, had a lot of engagement. And I, I'll say it right now, I told my boss, two things um, uh, about a month or so ago. I told him two things that you'll never take from me. And we should all be focused on this. I don't like telling people, but you need to tell your boss that they'll never take these two things away from you. Number one, time with your child. Mm -hmm. yeah, you cannot get it back. Mm -hmm. And at being 40, having a three-year-old, I've seen a lot of people that are my age that have 15-year-olds who missed so much of their children growing up. I know a lot of 50-year-olds who missed time and now their kids are out of the house mm -hmm. and they can't get that time back. Never let your employer take away that valuable time with your child. Number two, don't let your employer take away your health. Mm -hmm. Don't let them stress you out. Don't let them give you anxiety over this expectation that they have that you may or may not ever be able to meet. Mm -hmm. Don't let them take away your happiness and your joy 
because you're going to the doctor at 43 years old with stress and anxiety because you're, 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 you're in such a bad place emotionally about work. Never let them take away the time with your, with your children. Never let them take away your health. Mm, man. And so that's, that's how that's, I suck my day. That, dude, I'm, I'm gonna tell you, that's so, and I hope folks understand that the importance of setting your priorities in life, right? You gotta have your non-negotiables, right? For me, it's all about, you know, my faith, then it's about me being the husband that my wife needs in every capacity and being the father that my children need in every capacity. And now there, there are levels under each one of those, but those are the three things. Those are my three non-negotiables, my faith, my wife, and my kids. Those three things are non-negotiable and you're not gonna take those things away from me. If they need me in any capacity, guess what? I'm there. That no, no, And that also means me being in the best shape that I can be in mentally, emotionally, spiritually, yeah, physically, yeah, because yeah. they need they need me. Right. And so, again, to whatever things that I can control, I'm going to do it to the best of my ability to make sure that I'm not sacrificing or putting any of my priorities, those three things in jeopardy. So whether it's a job, a business, an opportunity, you know, a contract or whatever, if it comes and that's always been my litmus test of any opportunity, I don't care how good or how bad it is, does it come into conflict with my priorities? And those three priorities, if it comes into conflict with it, I don't really care what it is or how big it is, it ain't happening. It's not gonna work. It's not gonna make you happy in the long term. So that's, you know, being a father for me has, has been life-changing. You know, this opportunity, having a chance just to tell my story to you and, and be able to spend time, um, to be there for my son, to, to just hold him and to, Spending that one-on-one -on -one time um, is just the best part of every day for me. And I'm just happy, truly, truly happy and truly fortunate to have the, the lifestyle. I just consider what I do more of a lifestyle. I mean, they mm -hmm. pay me. My, people always ask me, they're like, is this your full-time job? And I'm like, yeah. And in addition to the operations, the business piece, I also get an opportunity to act, to get, I get a chance to produce. Um, I said, this whole thing got started because I was writing, right? And th so then I'll also be able to direct. I mean, so all of the things in the world of arts that I that I love to do, I mean, I'm going to start with her. I mean, the stage is, let's see if you see the stage. Oh, that's wow. A piece, we don't have the whole stage built right now. This is a piece. But we're, mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's my stage, right? And mm -hmm. so I get to come in every day and look at the place and, and say, you know, that's my stage. And I get to act and I get to direct and I get to produce. I get to write. I get to run our business. I get to be a great father and show my son um, what it's like to be accountable and be dependable and be a leader and to be focused and be committed. So it's for me, that's everything. Mm. Brothers, if anything, I want you to look in the mirror and realize that you all are artists. And what do artists do? They bring creative solutions to the table. And my brother, Ken Herring, Kenneth Herring, my frat brother, my dude, the connector, the, the artist, I, He's the embodiment of it all. And if you never thought of yourself as an artist, I hope after this conversation, you can now look in the mirror and realize that, you know what, in your own way, no matter who you are, no matter how right brain or left brain or how straightforward or how outside the box your thinking is, guess what? You're an artist. Mm -hmm. So brother, I salute you, man. How can anybody who's outside of the Knoxville area or even in the Knoxville area, how can they connect with you, hear more about what you got going on, connect with River and Rail? Give all the tags, brother. Yeah, awesome. So um, we've got two on social media, um, um, River and Rail Theater Company. That's River and Rail Co. on Instagram, River and Rail Theater Company on Facebook. Um, you can also check us out um, online, www.riverandrailtheater.com. Or you can go to www.oldcityperformingartscenter.com. Okay. Uh, and then we've got Old City Performing Arts Center um, social media tags. Old City PAC, P-A-C is in Performing Arts Center, is on Instagram and Old City Performing Arts Center on Facebook. So gotcha. you can look at information about all of our shows. You can look at our interesting Pay What You Wish program, which allows people to come to shows for as little as $3. It has information on all of our shows. Um, some of the other things that we're doing, special events, we've gotten into film. Um, we do some workshops and some training, some trainings that um, help people to become more effective communicators. So we do a lot of really good things. We like the tagline more than a theater company uh, because we are more than just a theater company. Um, but that is our bread and butter. So hopefully you all can check us out. Um, we're, we're getting ready to release a film called Light Years, which is a 
uh, COVID documentary. So we got all kind of cool stuff, man. So I, I appreciate you having me, brother. My man, I appreciate you. I make sure to have the tags in the show notes. Y'all check out River and Rail Theater Company on IG, on Facebook, and Old City Performing Arts on Facebook, Instagram. Go to the websites, check yeah. them out. And then if you go through there a little bit, you'll probably see the name of Managing Director Kenneth Herring. Click on it. That's Absolutely. the brother that you heard about yep. today. Yep. And if you connect with him, if you come to a show, if you see him in public, if you DM him or whatever, yeah. if you don't know him already, let him know you heard about him on Black Fathers Now and how inspirational his story was. I appreciate you, brother. I appreciate you, man. Fellas, 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 and ladies listening too, because y'all like to tune in to understand what we're talking about. Y'all continue to support Black Fathers Now. Share this thing out. Go to River and Rail Company on IG, Facebook, the Old City Performing Arts Center on Facebook, IG. Connect with Kenneth Herring. His story is amazing. But I also want you to take away this. When you look in the mirror, I want you to realize that you are an artist. And what does an artist do? An artist brings creative solutions to the table. And so make sure they leave ratings for this. And until next time, y'all be blessed, well, and wise. And I'll holler at you. Peace.